Welcome to part two of our interview with uh, Professor Mohamed Hassan. Professor, uh, previously in part one of the interview, you have already explained the root cause and the complications of the conflicts within the Horn of Africa region. Now, inferring from this, my question is, uh, what's required diplomatically among the countries in the Horn of Africa to navigate more uh, effectively within the shifting geopolitical dynamics among the non-African players? Very good. Uh, normally, uh, diplomacy is an extension of the policy of the government of the country itself. Diplomacy is not something separate that you can only handle it in a diplomatic way. Diplomacy is, is a reflection of the policy of the given government. If a government is based on self-reliance, building, food security, and so on and so on as in Eritrea, the diplomacy of Eritrea is based on these elements that you deal with other states on the basis of national sovereignty and enhancing the internal project of the country. There is no isolated diplomacy. For countries who are dependent by external forces, the diplomacy is based on a dependent dependency and enlarging dependence. In fact, they don't have any diplomacy. They get just go to an order and they realize that order of their masters from a distance. So when you talk about uh, states who can have a diplomatic relationship and embassies outside, it is not necessarily that it is all of them are sovereign states who really want a paternal relationship on the basis of the national sovereignty and national respect States. So this has to be defined very clearly. Diplomacy is not something, an acrobat, which is outside of the state structure. Diplomacy and the, 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 the diplomacy of a given country, it's connected to it is also ruling class and the nature of it is ruling class. What they wanted to achieve by their own diplomacy. It has to be seen from this point of view. That gives you to understand the nature of that state, the, uh, uh, and their diplomatic relationship with the external forces. You can analyze it only on that basis. In the past, in the region, the region never had a diplomacy, particularly Ethiopia and Somalia, of course, was in turmoil, Djibouti, Kenya and Uganda, these countries are absolutely dependent. How can you have diplomacy when 60% of your national budget is subsidized by external force? You will not have an independent diplomacy. In fact, you will have only a servant who just uh, uh, listens and go what his master tells him. What we want in the whole of Africa is, and the new whole of Africa's concept, first of all, national independence of the region. If the region is following a national independence, inter-regional relationship, and solidarity among the different states, then these states have a vision to rebuild a new relationship among the people in the ter in term of economics, social, and so and so on. Then the diplomacy of this region will be a different one. One who respects the sovereignty of others and defends the sovereignty of the region. It is not an isolationist diplomacy. It will be an activist diplomacy to merge 
and to deal with all the nations in the world and the people of nations on the basis of respect of sovereignty of those countries in the region. That is why when we speak about the new Horn of Africa, the new Horn of Africa in all terms of it, it is not the same as the Horn Africa of the past. The past Horn of Africa is a dependent, have not its own diplomacy, its diplomacy is in service of external forces. When the Wayani was ruling Ethiopia, you have seen that it is it is in tandem, they were working with the imperialist countries, and they tried to attack, to minimize, undermine the other countries who have an independent, sovereign uh, uh, vision for their country, and also have an independent, sovereign uh, uh, concept of economic, social, and so on and so on. But once with the elimination and the disappearance of Guyane, with the agreement, the three patriot agreement in Asmara between the three states, gradually the three states have one understanding. Peace has to prevail in the region. And you will see, you see now that it is this peace have been disturbed and using this ethno fascist Guyane as a troublemaker. And you see that the shuttle of American and European diplo diplomacy uh, pushing the government of Ethiopia in order to negotiate with a terrorist element who have ruled that country for 27 years and looted. And this group, it was the agent of external forces in our region. That situation has changed. Because of that situation changed in the last three years, uh, another type of diplomacy was developing. They have to intervene and disturb by engineering a civil war, by supporting in media, in diploma, by giving them diplomatic cover, and so on and so on. But of course, they will be destroyed and they are not strong enough, and they don't even represent the people of Tigray. So the new diplomacy of the region, after this, uh, 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 after the defeat of TPLF, will be a popular diplomacy that the antagonism, a false antagonism which have existed among the people will evaporate, and it will be based on the cooperation of all nations and the people of the Horn of Africa. This is my understanding of the new Horn of Africa diplomacy and the relationship among the people and the states. Excellent, thank you for that. Um, now we want to talk a little bit about um, reasons for optimism. Um, for some of the youth, the situation in the Horn can seem difficult. The youth are the primary targets of Western propaganda uh, from the negative portrayals of Africa, as well as making false promises and giving false hope in order for them to leave uh, their homes uh, and come to the West, where they are later treated like unwanted pests despite their hard work and contributions to their new home. It's disheartening to see the way they're treated on their journey and also upon arrival. My question is, what can you say to encourage uh, the youth to remain optimistic and stay home? First of all, uh, we, we, uh, this question can be divided into several parts. Uh, one of the reasons uh, uh, of the imperialist policies on Eritrea is what they call to remove the youth from Eritrea and encourage them to leave their country legally. And once they leave their country, then they are no more useful. The main purpose is that to weaken the Eritrean army and the Eritrean economy because it is part of the project of regime change. And these young people, whatever ambition they have and whatever difficulties they have, once they cross the border, those who are encouraging them to cross, they just drop them. Because the purpose is not to help them or to give them job or to improve their life. The second point is that the human trafficking. We could organize in a certain level that all intelligence service of the Western world know 
the big intelligence service know. A huge, you know that it is human smuggling today is bigger than the drug smuggling as far as it is a huge economy, a parasite economy. And of course, the illusion uh, uh, the youth have about and the domination of the media, the domination of this new type of media and so on, and the projection, uh, projection of uh, 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 of Western media about the life in the, in the imperialist countries as if it is a country of honey and milk. And of course, it steals the mind of a lot of young people from most of African countries and also from other third world countries in Asia. And added with this uh, uh, full factor and the, the smugglers, a lot of young people die in the desert, in the sea, and so and so on. And those even after they got ex uh, exhausted and reached into the door of the imperialist countries, then they are also suffering because they don't get the paper quickly and this and this. A lot of psychological problems and this and this. And those who have succeeded and probably and they are lucky, they might get a residence permit and they might work and maybe also some of them can study. Uh, capitalism, it is based on migration. Uh, as you know, to give you an illustration, uh, uh, studies which is made in the European Union in 2000, they say that it is uh, European Union in general, because of it is population is aging, and there is no a lot of children, and there is a risk that it is the economic situation can be in a serious problem. The studies indicate that. This is a study which is made in 2000 by European Union, which they don't publish it openly or they don't bring it in the media. They say that it is the European Union with this declining, a fast declining demographic condition, if they don't allow yearly millions of young immigrants, then the European Union economy in 2000 for example, in 2050, 60% of the inhabitants will be pensioners. So there is a serious demographic crisis. And they are encouraging and telling this study, the people who did the study, we need 13,500,000 new young workers. This is scientific study. But how the politicians uh, to sell that to the public, they are so frightened because extreme right wing parties, they only survive by talking about how to stop these people not to come. And it is they are selling an, 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 a wind toward their uh, 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 citizens and they use with one issue migration problem. But scientifically, when you analyze, that it is a friend of mine, Harpa Brar from UK. He had published a, a, a very good study, Capitalism and Immigration, and a very good studies. Uh, 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 and he indicates that whether they like it or not, one day they will be obliged. So in one side, capitalism by itself, it is because of it is global and by itself needs more labor. And needs more labor, whatever color they are, it doesn't matter, needs young, dynamic people in all forces, in all, not only labor in a sense, even labor who are uh, using their uh, intellectual capacity, uh, others using their hand and so on. Huh? Other example, uh, because of the aging of European uh, Union population, that it is, and life, because it is, life expectancy also has increased because of modern life, because of that it is people, they don't die anymore, 
or in 60 or 40 years old and so on, they can remain until 1995 and so and so on. And this, of course, uh, putting pressure that it is, it is their right, they work for it, they have to be paid as pensioners. And of course, the older the population becomes, you need also another type of economy and another type of treatment that a lot of old age homes have been uh, developing. And there also needs a lot of young people to help the old people and to give service to them. So you, uh, the racist argument of the racist parties and so on collapses here. Uh, if I'm old, I'm at home and so on, in a home and I need assistance and so on. I don't care the color of the young man and woman who come to help me uh, in that age, whether uh, maybe even if he sings Bob Marley's song, I will sing with him because it is he's like my son or she is my daughter, she will help me. But the gutter plays, the media in general, the television and so on, they don't talk about that. They hide from the population. So the scientific studies indicate that Europe needs a lot of work. And when you see Europe, including Eastern Europe also, for example, if you go to Bulgaria, majority of the youth have left. Romania, the same. Bulgaria became a country of old people, pensioners. So Europe will face between now and the coming decade, a very serious demographic crisis. The problem is that the media and others, they don't want to talk about it. They avoid the disaster not to see. In normal circumstance, take now if you calculate it, a young man of 25 arrives what is the role of immigration or the immigrant young people who came, or most of them from the 60s until now who came in Europe? The immigrant, they are, they have four factors. When they came to uh, Britain and other places, the first thing this immigrant, they added to the national food. Today, when you are in UK, most of the people, they like to eat Indian food. There is six million Indians and British Indians. So it increased the quality of the food of the British people. That is one factor, which is a multicultural. You see, the food industry itself, it has changed and it produced this Indian food, Asian food, Thai food, and so on. So, so most of our children, they grow up with this food because it is Mom, she she buys this, she brings, she makes tandoori, she makes a, 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 a Thai food, and so, and so on. Comparatively from the older generation, only eating the same potato and this and this, diversity of food. So migration is a plus point. It the food situation of the host country. That is one factor. Second, the immigrant. And a young man, a young immigrant, uh, 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 comes, works there. Imagine, they didn't even train him or her. Huh? For example, if she is a graduate of secondary school of university, the host country without paying a single cent, in fact, all her studies was paid by her uh, former country, she comes or he comes. 23 years old, it's a gift. You don't have to train him, you don't have to train her. So in fact, it is a gift for, they didn't spend anything in this individual. He works then, or she works there for 40 years, and she increases the national economy. She contributes to the national uh, uh, economy in all terms. She pays tax and so on and so on, and she contributes to the national security fund. That is also after the food, it is also she works or he works, he contributes in production, he pays tax, and he contributes also for national uh, 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 
pension fund, which is means he is paying for the pensioners now because he is not in pension yet. Contribution of an immigrant. Uh, the, th the third important thing, of course, as I have told you, the immigrant brings its food and increases also the quality of the food. The third is he marries and he has children. So he contributes of in the demography of the country. The country which was demographically declining because of the immigrants having children, it increases the demographic condition of the host country. Uh, so uh, this is the fourth element. He marries, he has to or she marries, they have children and so on. The first element of the immigrant is a revolutionary because he has relatives in, the, in his country where he comes and he also helps and sends remittance to the families there. So he increases the economy of the host country. He has children in the host country. He brings a new type of food and increases the quality of the food. And at the same time, he fights and sends money to his family and he, in fact, helps the life of the people former country. Therefore, the immigrant is a full revolutionary, you could say. He contributes in everything. He contributes left and right. The right-wing parties, they don't analyze. That's why you young people, uh, I want you to write uh, a journal called Lalka, Lalka. Please write Lalka, L A L L A L K A R. It's an Indian word. L A L K A R. Lal -ka -R. This is an Indian working class journal. It was established about almost 95 years ago. Sometimes this is one of the uh, ideological journal with my best comrade, Hapabrar, and so on and so on, we promote and we discuss about world issues. So there you have to go. There is in the website, Lalka, and then you type capitalism and immigration. And then you will find the whole study. It's about 60 pages and something. What I was talking about is I took it from there. It is a discussion, then we published it in the party in Dutch and French. So I advise you to read that also, please. Capitalism and what was it, Professor? Capitalism and immigration. Thank you. Immigration. So you can read. So all these characteristics, the studies of European Union, but they never talk about it. Mm -hmm. huh? Like for you uh, in New Zealand, the elderly people is increasing. It's mm -hmm. a very small island and so on. They don't know from where they can replace it. But this, they discuss it in a closed room. Mm -hmm. They don't want it to come out. They the, don't same know. out the same Australia had also a crisis, a crisis of demography. But they never mention this in their media. They don't, uh, in scientific studies in certain universities, they release. But it is very a small group understand that. So, in order to understand how Europe is, how migration is, uh, how that it is European Union now is suffering from uh, 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 that is the majority of its population by 2050, which is means in, in 30 years time, that the majority of Europeans will be pensioners. This will bring a serious pressure in pension fund. If the majority are pensioners, those who are working, they will be minority. And they have to contribute for the, the majority pensioners, even though the pensioners have the right. So there is a crisis there. So that is why they are pushing the people to take a private pension, that the private companies can benefit out of it. You cannot solve it with privatization. You only make some people rich. But there is a social crisis. So our young people must understand and must understand how the system functions. And this system functions on this basis. 
Capitalism, the more it grows, the more it produces, the more it became a global and global and global. And this global situation that it is in the imperialist countries, in the uh, advanced capitalist countries, there is a serious demographic crisis. And this you see with the corona situation. You see that what happened to Italy, that the elderly people in a huge number died in Belgium and so on and so on. So you, you imagine that it is in 2050, if more than 60% of the population is our pensioners, which is means most of Europe will have a lot of uh, uh, pensioners' homes, then it is you need a service to them. There must be nurses and others who are going to help them, doctors and this and this. So we have to know that the media is lying. The media doesn't represent the population. And it doesn't explain. It only frightens the people. So please read that to understand yeah, what, yeah, how the system functions and the scientific studies you will see it there. So uh, Africa, it is the only continent where the majority of the population, almost 70% of the population, is younger than 40%, 40 years. 35 years in fact. In most of third world, that the the majority is the young people. But in Europe, its majority is becoming the elderly people. And these elderly people are citizens. They work hard, they pay the they pay the tax and so and so on. So it is this also I want you to understand that our youth, wherever they are, they have to understand how the system functions. That is it. Um, just to add uh, as well, uh, you mentioned food, but there's also many other benefits. Uh, just a few that I can think of uh, includes uh, culture, uh, arts, music, entertainment, yeah, um, and also business. I know, for example, in uh, Birmingham, uh, in the United Kingdom, that there was a large area that used to be used for um, clothes production in the 70s and 80s that were uh, factories that were being worked by uh, people for, of South Asian descent uh, who were also actually shipped in to the UK by the UK government um, to help with, with that. Um, when the factories shut down, you had kind of a ghost town developing there. And then in the late 90s, early 2000s, the Somali community actually invested their own savings their own money to set up small businesses in these former old decrepit unused uh, buildings that were becoming ghost towns they brought new life and the media never talks about that it only talks about the negative things that happen within the within the community for example i think it was 2006 there was a piracy situation in somalia uh, where um, a british couple uh, uh, were taken hostage uh, the British government said, we don't negotiate with terrorists. We will not negotiate to get them back. So the Somali community, the business Somali community in London got together and they raised, I think it was 20 million US dollars to free those people. Now, when the, hostage, uh, when the hostages were taken, this was front page news all over uh, the UK. When the Somali community in the UK paid for the release and talked to these guys through their relatives back home, no one talked about this. Nobody mentioned this. Of course, they will never mention that. The gutter press there, they mentioned, they have, the, the press in general, in, in general is not a press to unify the people and to make them to struggle and to, to be one. The press is that it is, you have two types of presses in that country. It is, you have the Financial Times, which was even uh, the English is used is different there. The working class most of the time doesn't read it. It's a very expensive journal. And it is by experts, it is written and advised to the ruling class. Huh? The, they advise them how to resolve their crisis. Then you have the gutter press. The gutter press is that it is to, uh, to, to uh, put uh, sand on the population 
uh, creating fake titles that Great Britain uh, uh, is in, uh, invaded by immigrants, and the immigrants didn't have uh, uh, these refugees, didn't have uh, money and so on. They are eating the birds uh, uh, of Great Britain. The number of the birds are decreasing. It's a fake, such kind of technique to frighten the elderly people who are pensioned and are at home and who are watching every day uh, uh, from the window when a stranger type of person passes and so on, they call to the police to inform and so on and so on, to terrorize the population. In, in a condition where there is the progressive people, the progressive parties, the democratic, real democratic parties of the people are weakened and the right wing is rising in a faster rate, that it is the right wing is inculcating, uh, in fact, rubbish in the eyes of the people, and uh, that is why they confuse. We, our young people, they should read, they should uh, read and understand the technique of the ruling class, how is trying to divide, one time uses color, one time uses the, uh, other reasons, uh, religion, Islam, whatever it is, then is anti-China, then and this and so and so. This is the technique of the ruling class, including their gutter press, which is engineering. And of course, to defend ourselves, one of the major elements to defend, uh, you know, now we are in Corona time. It calls that it is you have to keep the distance, you have to take the mask, and so on and so on. This is the primary, you have to wash regularly your hand and so on. So for our youth also, who live in, 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 in these imperialist countries, that also they have to, like Corona, they have to defend themselves. To defend themselves in the sense, the only way to defend yourself, increase your knowledge, understand the society, learn more, study more. Now, when we say study more, it is not what technically they are teaching you. There is no problem. But to study, to study their own history, their own people, how it have suffered, and so on and so on. Uh, 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 we, we can indicate, uh, 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 I would really like, particularly Mohammed, because you go to UK, uh, uh, I would really like this book, you can find also to our friends, uh, you will find it. It is uh, it is a a wonderful book, a starting book that I like our use to read it. Uh, can we stop one minute uh, to check the book? Yes, I wait. No. I will I will I will uh, tell you please when you go to England or you Google it. Now they republished it again. It's called Ireland. Her own, an outline history of the struggle. Mm -hmm. The first colony of England is Ireland. Mm -hmm. Before that, Ireland was a very civilized country. England invaded Ireland and colonized for 800 years. The United Kingdom had an experience in Ireland. After that experience, she went out. And the Irish resisted 800 years until 1920. They got independent. They engineered the famine in Ireland and they killed half of the population. Ireland is a Celtic speaking people. They destroyed their language. That language doesn't exist anymore. But the Irish people are brave, continued struggling continuously. And finally, they go to their independence and they defeated Britain in 1920 except North Island, Belfast, and then later it took long. So in order to understand 
what does it mean colonialism? What does it mean imperialism? Just read this book. Simultaneously, you will also reading, by reading this book, you are reading English history. The other side of it. So you benefit for both. You will be well versed in United Kingdom. Mm -hmm. And at the same time on Irish. The man who wrote, he is an English communist. He said, I'm writing this book not to the Irish, because there is a lot of Irish progressive revolutionaries wrote about Irish. I'm writing this to the English working class to understand this conflict from where it comes. This is they never teach you in the universities. This kind of history is the hidden history. You have to find it yourself. You have to be a, 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 a acquainted by accident somebody to give you an advice. All this I didn't learn in the university. Lucky I was by having a contact with some people, developed another type of research, how to read and how to read the correct historical narrative. Mm -hmm. So I advise you, uh, uh, I mean, the Kennedy family, they were just, uh, they were Irish. They left as immigrants when the potato harvest broke and the Irish people were in a famine and half of the population of Ireland was killed. In the United States, the first Irish Catholic president came from the Kennedy family. Before it was impossible. The second is Reagan. The third is Clinton, which was fighting us in our region. It doesn't mean because you came from an immigrant, oppressed, and so and so and so, and so on, you will always also be a man of justice. Finally, you can be co-opted and you can be very brutal. It's interesting that Bill Clinton, who has Irish roots, Yes. Uh, used the terminology, the Irish of Africa, when he was referring to Somalia and the Somalis. I don't know if you're aware. <laughs> he, he uses Ironic. that argument to uh, hoodwink uh, the Somalis. It is his policy which, which, which caused a lot of problem in the whole of Africa. Mm. So the issue is our youth, young people, have to be very prudent and study and read. As I have told you last time, British colonial administrator who was transported to Egypt, he said, we have to destroy their educational system. There must not be a negotiation and debate between the teacher and the people. And we have to transform it into as the Arabs they say, read, but don't understand. So you don't get surprised people who have a certificate from universities. They are schooled, but they are not educated. There is a big difference between a schooled one and an educated one. And what we want, those really educated ones, complete education in all terms of it. An educated, well-versed youth is dynamic. Very dynamic and it can it can move a mountain. But this this youth must be divert, uh, diverted to another thing. Drug, uh, pornography, sex, you have to use instincts, the negative instincts, to canalize them and, and waste their age and their time. 
Second, try to block the, to block the use not to discuss. This discussion, if there is a discussion, they even infiltrate and they will make it a conflict. They don't want people to gather and discuss about their common issues. If people discuss about their common issues, they will come to their conclusion. So that is why they infiltrate through intelligence service. They take our daughters and sons, put them in the intelligence service, disturb the communities, try to buy them and so on, send them to their country to be a fifth column and so on and so on. So, on. so the role of children, it has a lot of positive things, but there is also a danger that it is the host country where they were born and so on can use them in reverse. We have to be, and this we can only break it because we are by having such kind of a discussion, such kind of debate among ourselves. Whatever it is, even one hour in a week, it, it will be a plus point. After they frustrate you and become and humiliate you by this racist type of propaganda, you will withdraw. And you will withdraw and, and you, you look for ideas. And of course, they will create or organization or people for you to win. And then they will push you to take radicalize uh, on the name of Islam or Buddhism or this and this and this. At the same time, they can use our use by sending them to the project they have designed, like in Syria. 80,000 terrorists have entered the Syria through Turkey. A lot of them are sons and daughters of immigrants. So you use them again, huh? and they will, they will be their own soldiers. In reverse, they will go and destroy their homeland. You have to keep the consciousness of the youth healthy. We have to dialogue with our sons and daughters. Not a monologue type, a dialogue. Discuss with them democratically, explain to them, have not necessarily the elderly have the same experience. The elderly, maybe they were very nice, polite people, and so on, and this and this. But the youth have also other qualities, other types of things that also can be used as a positive to organize the youth. And from youth, this youth, we can create a huge ladders, future ladders of the nation, which they will have a very big influence in their home life. This is my advice. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Professor, for the detailed explanation. Well, uh, as we are all observing, the new geopolitical paradigm is emerging in the long volatile region in the Horn of Africa. And as a result of this, uh, the region is in transition and the making of the new Horn of Africa, as you usually hear to say, is underway. So uh, my question is, uh, how politics in the interstate as well as intrastate relations in the Horn are developing and what future trends might be? First of all, our region has never been volatile. Volatile is a term of the imperialist to the use. It is a racist term. It is degrading us. We have never been volatile. We lived for centuries there. Who is putting this tag on us? Volatile means we don't like each other. Crazy people and like to kill each other. It's a word which hides their invisible hand by creating the crisis in the region. 
Imagine if this invisible hand doesn't exist. Our region will not be volatile. We could have walked peacefully and cooperated with all the people in the region and the states, build our economic infrastructure, build our relationship uh, on the new basis, build our culture, build our news, and so on. Who stops that? Who is the one who is creating the volatile situation in our region? That must be identified by the youth very clearly. Always when they write about the region, they say a region is a volatile. We are not genetically aggressive people. We have lived for a very long time there. And there is no a genetical contradiction among the peoples in the state in that area. Principle number one, one have to know who is the one who's creating this volatile situation in the region. To understand that, one have to study 70 years of external interference in our region, engineering war, conflict, and so on and so on. They are putting a stone in our shoes not to work properly. They are the ones who are trying to move our youth from their uh, country and remove, go out and then let them suffer in the Sahara, in the sea, and so on and so on. When you say we want peaceful region, you need, when you create a peaceful region, means the first thing you have changed your environment, which is, means you live in a peaceful neighborhood. Nobody likes to live in, in uh, 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 a difficult and a conflict area. This concept of a new horn of Africa is a concept of building new neighborhood, peaceful cooperation. That's why they don't like it. That's why they try to single out our leadership, giving them a tag, a new name, and so on and so on. That's why now they are, the Guyana fascist organization invaded Wallo and invaded other places with the support of the imperialist forces. These are agents. The, whole, the new Horn of Africa in concrete means you change the neighborhood atmosphere. And when this neighborhood is peaceful, cooperation and working together develops spontaneously. People move, businesses move from one place to another place, antagonism collapses, and people live a normal life. They don't want us to have a normal life. They want the normal life for themselves, not for us. Because their major objective is to control our region for a lot of other reasons, and exploit our population, our resources, use our region, as a battleground or a strategical place and so on. So the new Horn of Africa project, which was signed also with the three patriot agreement, is to create a new neighborhood. And this new neighborhood will be a peaceful and also a brotherly neighborhood. It will be on this basis that the economy and the social system will increase. And people will know each other more and more. The more transportation means is built, the more uh, 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 business link is built, the more the youth knew each other, meet in sport, meet in conferences, meet everywhere. Uh, the more that it is, the movement of people between the whole of African people is becomes open and, and, and no difficulties and so on. That people will know each other and this will give an, an energy for boosting our economy. That they don't want. The new world of Africa equals two plus two new neighborhoods. 
ask anybody you live in Sweden, and when you talk to the top to a Swedish man, you have to tell him, do you really like in a, to live in an aggressive neighborhood? You like that it is you and your family and your children to live in a very aggressive area? Of course he doesn't like. Then why he doesn't like for us to have a new neighborhood? Swedish is in the front line who's attacking Eritrea. So the new Horn of Africa is building a new neighborhood. And that new neighborhood creates a self-confidence and a confidence building relation among the people. Once you consolidate that, you can go in economic, social, and so on, and then we can start a better life for our people. Food security, we will be independent, we can produce more food, not only for us, but we can even export. And we can engage in a modern economic relation with anybody. We are not harming anybody, we didn't say we hate this, we hate this, we just said we want a good neighborhood. And that is a crime from the point of view of the interior. And then they will give you different names and tags. That is it. Thank you, um, Professor. Um, so this is going to be uh, our last question for this uh, part two version. So it is still going to be in the idea of optimism. So one can be um, forgiven for um, being anxious about the future of the horn. However, there are many reasons for optimism. First, we see major change around the world, countries and competing to be accepted by African nations, and then more ready um, to have mutual uh, beneficial relationship with uh, Africa, as opposed to traditionally um, exploitive relations. And secondly, the immense resources. Um, the primary one um, being human capital, a large young um, population eager to cooperate uh, for better, more self-guided future. Both the citizen in the diaspora and then back home are educated, hardworking, and eager for further progress in their nations in they're independent um, of negative um, external influences. Then there are resources that we have been blessed with. Uh, for example, the sea, sun, wind, water, fertile, so on, land, um, minerals, oil, gas. So my question is, what do you think of the prospect um, for cooperation between citizens back home and the diaspora for future progress uh, with their respective nations, countries, and in the new horn. Um, what do you think about it? Very good. Thank you, my daughter. Uh, uh, until 2018, April, mm -hmm. our uh, uh, commitment was First, to defend in all terms of it, Eritrea. Mm -hmm. Because Eritrea is the torch and the frontline states against the external force. Mm -hmm. And we are happy, we mobilized, we struggled, and so on. And then the change came in Ethiopia. The coming of change at the same time, Prime Minister Dr. Abiy coming to power, and the agreement, with, uh, the relationship between Eritrea and Ethiopia became normal, and the three patriot agreement which was signed between Somalia, Ethiopia, and Eritrea in Asmara. That is the second chapter we are living now. The second chapter we are living is. As I have said, the new whole of Africa project of us 
which we have always dreamed in the last 70 years, now start walking little bit as a baby. Therefore, our sons and daughters and our community in diaspora, they have to work hand and glove together, not only as Eritrean, Ethiopian, and Somalis, and so on, as the great horn of African people and citizens. We have to raise this consciousness to that level. Because we are in a new historical conjecture. This task will be the task of you young men and women educated live in different parts of the world. Your discussion with your partners everywhere must be how we can strengthen what we had won and how we can cement it strongly and how can we elevate it strongly to the future, the present and the future. That nobody can reverse this a new historical development in Africa. Our debate must be one, to remove the false curtain they have put in among us in order to divide us and divide and rule system of them that they have succeeded for 70 years, but full stop, it is over now. All progressive and militant individuals and groups of the Horn of Africa, now they have to unite and think like one man and one woman to the future. Our future is bright. Our children's future also will be bright. Provided we are clever, understand the enemy, and understand the contradiction among the people. Contradiction among the people can be resolved by discussion, by raising the consciousness of the people. But the enemy is constantly is watching us. The enemy is not satisfied until he comes and break us. We have to be resilient, united, conscious, organized. If we can do that, my daughter will succeed. And I am very, very uh, uh, happy to meet my daughters and sons uh, like you and so on. And we have to join in hand. We have to raise the consciousness of our sons and daughters with, uh, 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 everywhere in the world. And I wish you all the best. Continue, work, and struggle. Let us organize. Organize, organize, organize. That is my motto. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. I think uh, this is going to be the end. The last thing I want to say is I like the fact that you say um, the youth have to be educated, not scold. So I think we're going to end um, with this one. I don't know if you guys have something to say. Uh, all good? Yeah, okay. well... <laughs> Thank you, Professor. Um, we really appreciate for your time uh, coming here discussing about um, different topics, especially on this platform, Horn of Africa TV, uh, for the especially for the youth program. And I hope uh, we'll see you in different discussion or book review um, in different time. And dear viewers, thank you for your time. And, and I hope we're going to come and see you with different topic and different guests. Thank you. Thank you.